Okay, we're back, and here we are on tape number five. This tape um, is, we're going to kind of regress just a little bit and go back to some of Billy's early years, and we're also going to go over his early contacts with Ascot. Billy's, of course, most well known for all of his contacts with the Pleiadians, which began in 1975, and few people are aware, actually, that he had contacts almost throughout his entire life and that by the time the Pleiadian contacts had started, Billy had already had years of contacts with another race and with other people and had been on many adventures which had served to educate him up to this point so the contacts with the Pleiadians would really be possible. Kind of an interesting side note, I want to give you a little background into Billy's early life. Uh, on an earlier tape we discussed his um, early contacts with Spaff, the uh, old Pleiadian man who had kind of uh, helped him through his early years, he had caused him to be born at a certain time, and saw to his early education, and had also taken Billy up for his first ride in a spaceship. Well, Billy's young school years were plagued with problems. You can almost imagine a, a young person in school that uh, is having visitations from highly evolved extraterrestrial beings. It, it's very difficult then to go back to the, the schoolyard or the, the classroom and uh, deal with mundane things like reading and writing when your mind is filled with far-off things of the universe and complex uh, philosophical and spiritual uh, philosophies and ideas that are running through your head. So Billy had a lot of difficulty really dealing with being an average child. And because of this, he spent a lot of time just being absent from school, from wandering out in the forest, thinking on his own, being led out into nature to discover and to observe more about nature and its laws. Because many things were going through his head, because he was constantly receiving telepathic transmissions from staff during these years. Well, what happened was Billy became kind of the, uh, you know, the town juvenile delinquent. Uh, that's what they thought of him. He was always skipping school. And any time something would go wrong or somebody would complain about something, like uh, maybe something missing from their house or something, they'd usually blame it on young Billy right away. Billy, for some reason, had trouble defending himself. Uh, whenever he would be questioned by the local authorities about, you know, uh, what his connection was, maybe with a certain crime or problem, Billy somehow would just keep quiet and not even answer. And he always felt it kind of unusual himself that he wasn't able to do this. But it got him in a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, he landed in uh, uh, young men's institutions on a couple of different occasions uh, because he just wouldn't speak up for himself, and he was assumed guilt in many cases. He even remarks that in some cases he would go ahead and sign the police reports, knowing full well that he had nothing to do with the crime that had been committed, but found himself still incarcerated in some sort of institution for the... Uh, I guess you would call it the young insane or the young troublemakers. He finally wound up in what's called the Renault Clinic, which is the, uh, a clinic for people who are uh, psychically disturbed, where psychiatrists and psychologists can observe people. He was kind of young for that, but apparently um, too many uh, days and uh, weeks alone on the street and so forth uh, led him to too many problems, and he wound up in this Renault Clinic. Well, not wanting to stay there, Billy devised an escape plan. And what he did was he uh, made a little key out of some wood that uh, there was kind of like a wooden throw rug in his room. He devised a little key out of that, and one night he broke out of the Renault Clinic by getting through a window in the bathroom. He had to drop about, uh, I think, about 20, 25 feet to the ground below, which was concrete. He did, and in doing so, he twisted his foot and badly injured his foot. At the time, he felt it was probably broken. It's 11 o'clock at night, and it's, uh, I believe it was in November. It was very dark and cold outside. So he uh, jumped over the fence and got away, left the clinic. Uh, about that time, he heard the dogs and the sirens going off. Someone had detected that he was missing. They were looking for him. Billy uh, ran through the woods and came uh, to the Rhine River and dove in the river thinking there was no way they would expect him to dive in the river uh, on a cold uh, wintry night and swim, but he did. And he did make good his escape. He swam down the river for a ways. Must have been awfully cold. When he got out of the river, he stopped, uh, ate some grass and leaves and so forth. He had spent so much time in the forest, he was beginning to understand what to eat and what not to eat and knew a lot about nature. Uh, ate some uh, plants or whatever that he had found there and made his way out of the country. 
and traveled for several months. Actually, he, what he did is he snuck out of Switzerland and made his way all the way across the country into France, where he joined the Foreign Legion. It doesn't say exactly what the date or the year is in here, but he managed to join the Foreign Legion, and at that time when he got to France, his foot, was, which was really troubling him still, he got some medication and some help with his foot, and the Foreign Legion then packed him off to Algeria. Well, he wasn't in the uh, French Foreign Legion too long when he decided this was not for him, and he already started to plan his escape. Uh, he was told by the other legionnaires not to even consider it because the remote area they were in, he was miles and miles from any kind of civilization and surely would experience the greatest trials and tribulations if he tried actually to strike out on his own across the desert because there were no oases, there was no food and water, and he would surely perish. So Billy looked at it as like, gee, this could be a living hell. So he decided to abandon the ideas, what he told everybody. But So everybody left him alone on that thought and didn't expect him to follow through on those ideas. However, secretly, he was still planning to do it. He did make good his escape one night and spent two and a half months crossing the dangerous deserts in Algeria to get back to any kind of civilization. During this time period, he almost died on several occasions. Telepathically, he was uh, encouraged in a couple of occasions by Ascot, who at that time was his newfound teacher, who told him and kept encouraging him to go on, to fight it, and to, to make it, and he did. Well, oddly enough, he fights all the way back, gets back to Europe, and decides to turn himself into the police and confess everything that he's done, uh, draw a clean slate of it. He does this and is immediately put back in the Renault Clinic again, where a Dr. Rosselli, or R-O-S-S-L-I is how I believe it's spelled in the contact notes, uh, he conducts an interview with Billy to see, uh, you know, check him out. Um, the doctor listens to Billy's strange stories because Billy's telling him all about what's happened to him, about his contacts when he's young, his visitations with Ascot, his telepathic things. And the doctor doesn't seem to be too uh, overwhelmed with all this, but yet he doesn't write any of it down. Uh, Billy is then brought before the judge and is offered a chance to explain everything and uh, to perhaps maybe even get off it again. He's not able to defend himself and instead finds himself just standing there at the mercy of the court with no defense. He is given four and a half years in jail for his actions. And he spends that four and a half years in that clinic and other places uh, where he says he learned a lot about himself, life, and it was a great time to spiritually grow through his telepathic transmissions from Aska. So he had a rather rough childhood and teenage years start getting going. At that point, though, he actually finally leaves uh, Switzerland and spends about 12 years on the road going through foreign countries, and which brings him up uh, actually... Uh, to uh, where he meets his wife in Greece later on. Um, uh, he meets her in Greece on December 25th on Christmas Day 1965. Previous to that he had spent years on the road mostly in India, Pakistan and those area uh, working in all sorts of odd jobs and so forth getting along. His contacts with Ascot now, is, which is what I really wanted to get into, but I want to give you a little background on Billy's teenage years. His contacts with Ascot actually begin on February 3rd, 1953, on his birthday. That's when the sound of Fast Voice left him. Ascot's voice then came into his head and has been guiding him since uh, during that time period. It's his roles and teachings with Ascot which are most fascinating and prepared him for the Pleiadian contacts. So I want to tell you a little bit about those. Okay. He meets Ascot on February 3rd on his birthday. It seems that most major occurrences in Billy's life occur on his birthdays. Uh, he was told even by Spath earlier times that his birth was quite significant on February 3rd, that very few people were actually born on February 3rd, 1937 at that time, at the exact point at 11.20 in the morning. And they seem to be very adamant about that was a very important time for people to be born. And anyone that was born right at that moment or very close to it would be very, very special people. It has something to do with this new age period and this jolt of new radiation energy that hits the planet and will cause increased awareness. So... His telepathic uh, transmissions from Ascot uh, begin then on February 3rd, 1953, and it's not till his birthday on February 3rd, 1956, that he actually meets Ascot. 
Uh, about 16 days previous to his birthday, he has sent a telepathic transmission by her that she's coming, that they will actually meet. He's, he's familiar with the location where they're going to meet because it's a place that he likes to go frequently uh, where he would just kind of be alone with himself and contemplating his life. So it's very cold uh, the morning that he sets out for this contact. Sun's just been up a couple of hours, and it's freezing cold in February in Switzerland, high in the mountains. Billy goes out for his contact to meet Aska. He climbs high up on the hill where they're to meet, and he's very, very cold, and he notices suddenly this uh, shining little, uh, this looks like a little ball shooting down from space. It comes down very swiftly and uh, just then stops, and then gently just floats slowly down to the ground. And it's kind of, uh, it's a shimmering color, kind of silvery color, and it's a flying disc. So uh, he, no one gets out, and Billy feels somehow compelled just to start walking towards it, which he does, finds himself just floating or lifted right up inside of the ship. He's surprised once he gets inside of the ship. There's no one there. There's just one seat, and he's, he's alone. But uh, he's guided then to set in the seat, which he does. Uh, somehow he just has the, I, guess, I suppose that Ascot's guiding him telepathically at this point. He sits down in the seat, and no sooner does he do that than suddenly the thing seems to start moving. He doesn't feel any sensation of movement, but he sees in the screens in front of him, which are projecting the outside view, that he's slowly lifting up off the ground, and he's floating uh, over the general area. He feels telepathically ask it come into him calm him and explain that uh, she will meet him that the ship will bring him to her he finds himself floating right over the home of his parents where just for a brief moment ask it is giving him some uh, reminiscence about his parents his childhood and she's given him a rough idea a little bit about the family that he's going to have in the future and what his life will be like Billy notices something really strange though uh, he looks down and notices that the ship is dissolving all around him it just becomes invisible then he looks down and sees that he is also invisible he looks around and he doesn't see anything he's just in some sort of invisible form and he looks like he's just floating in the air well the ship or whatever he's in this uh, ship that has become invisible immediately moves way up high into the sky and Billy finds himself just kind of looking at the stars he's floating kind of half up in space and he notes that there's a half moon out that particular night well the device the flying device that he's in rapidly accelerates across the country and he finds himself looking out over the Indian Ocean the sun is bright and it's coming up over the Indian Ocean and just as rapidly as this flying device has gone up in the air it rushes down towards the earth gently floats down and lands and Billy gets out of the ship and again just floats right down and is standing on the ground he's not real sure where he's at he doesn't see Ascot, uh, the ship is not there he walks over to a giant rock uh, that's there on the ground and puts his hand on the rock he's surprised that the rock feels really warm Something interesting happens, though. As soon as he touches the rock, suddenly he's aware of where he's at. He knows that he's in Jordan. Now, most of Billy's life, he's had the feeling that uh, he's been here before. He quite often will be in his travels, will uh, know what's beyond the next turn. Uh, he can, he'll be on top of a mountain and he'll know what's on the next place. It's like he's been to these places before but can't quite remember it. Combined with that, he feels kind of like a stranger on the planet, like he's visiting here. And ever since his days with Spath and that his mission was revealed to him, he's becoming more and more of the aware of the fact that he is an unusual creature in creation, that he somehow is on a mission, that he is just visiting this planet, that he has served in this mission several lifetimes beforehand. These things and these reminiscences are already starting to come back to him. And as he's standing here in Jordan and has touched this rock, these reminiscences are coming back to him even greater, where he feels that he has been in this countryside. Suddenly he knows the entire area, and he has this sensation that he's very familiar with all of his surroundings. Well, as he's standing there thinking, he looks up in the sky again, and here comes the ship of Aska. And again, it looks very much like the first one that he just rode in. It just looks like a silver line just darting in from outer space, and it comes down to earth very rapidly, stops, floats down, and uh, gently lands on the ground. And finally, he's about to meet Ascot. Ascot steps out of the ship, and Billy's a little taken back as she's very beautiful to him.